this is Jessica Lewis. Hi, Heidi. Tell us where you are are right now. Good morning. Good morning. Where are you located, madam? Um, I am in the beautiful downtown of McMinnville, Oregon. So I am in the heart of wine country. Oregon wine country. I'm in Eugene, Oregon. I'm two hours away. I can actually get to Heidi. I've met her in person. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Time to Wine broadcast. And we're going to talk a little bit about Heidi, her Wine Crush podcast, as well as her work history, etc. So Time to Wine is a live broadcast featuring experts in wine, social media, leadership and marketing. The broadcast is on the second and the fourth Monday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. The live stream broadcast interview is the first and third Friday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is looking like it's going to be every week at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time based on how many people are lined up in the queue here. So Heidi started the Wine Crush podcast, which is twice per month in McMinnville, Oregon, in the heart of wine country. And we're going to talk about that. She also owns her own insurance agency, Country Financial. Mm -hmm. So Heidi, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work history? Oh, you told me to start at 10, but we're going to start like at 2. <laughs> so um, my background is fourth generation dairy farmers. So I grew up on the coast, um, home of Tillamook cheese. So home of cheese trees and ocean breeze. And um, and so that, I mean, that's really where I started. So at a young age, you know, I was out in the barn helping my parents with whatever needed to be done, whether it was cow milking or calf feeding or haying or whatever. Um, and so I learned very early how to work hard and I just didn't know any different. So it's definitely has lent to my work ethic now, which is um, I'm a workaholic, but I really love what I do. Um, from there, I went to college, was going to be a police officer. Um, I was terrible. I'm way too nice and way too friendly and kind. And it just didn't lend well to that. Um, <laughs> so at that point, I kind of pivoted. I you know, decided to wait tables for a while and kind of figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And um, I ended up um, working for a farm lending company for a while as a secretary. I'm a horrible secretary, so don't ask me to do that because I get super bored and I don't sit still well. And so that was a bad job for me, but luckily I got pregnant and was able to um, actually pursue a business that I had um, started probably about a year or so earlier um, being a mobile notary. So I think I was probably the first one in the state of Oregon that was doing it. Um, But I was basically taking loan papers to clients at their homes or tattoo parlors or wherever they were. I've been in some really, really weird situations. Um, But I think at that point, I really learned and didn't realize I was learning how to be an entrepreneur and how to market myself. So by the time McKinsey was born, I was had marketed myself to these major national title company brands. I worked for Fidelity and Tycor Title and whatever um, as their exclusive person in Oregon until that industry kind of blew up and the mortgage industry kind of put it. So um, I ended up getting divorced and um, started working at Wells Fargo Bank because I needed a job. And from there, it kind of led me to Country Financial, which I thought was just going to be a job too. It was insurance. I My grandfather was an insurance agent, my other grandfather, not the farmer. Um, the other one. And um, what I fell in love with it was the fact that everybody has to have insurance. It's a terrible bill. Nobody likes it. Um, but I could add that personal touch to it and really actually help families and help people with what they were doing and what they needed to be protected. So it's been 14 years and um, I love it. I have a great team, huge passion. Um, I still get up at 4 a.m., um, because that's the dairy farmer in me, and but I'm in bed early. I'm a pumpkin. I turned into a pumpkin at about nine. So I'm the opposite, which is why I think you were. I, I was joking when I said I'd be here in McMinnville at eight a.m. <laughs> you were very serious. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I usually do the office around seven, so I'm up at four, four, four thirty with my husband and get him out the door, and then I get to the office early because then I can leave early. I feel like I've put in my eight or 10 hours by that point and I can go home. I, <laughs> I'm usually up until 1 a.m. Okay. So, all right, let's talk a little bit. You have started a wine cr- crush podcast, which is very popular in McMinnville. So talk about that and tell us what's happening with that and what kind of guests you have and, and how you line up your guest. So this is our fourth season of wine crush. 
Um, we originally started recording with Portland Radio Project in Portland. They are a local radio station that really focus on local artists. They found me um, and wanted to develop a podcast um, kind of program within their radio station. So that's really where I started. And I have huge thank yous to Rebecca and Daniel and Jenna, who were my original you know, team for this. And they really kind of started me on the path to where we are. And um, we have since moved into a new office and I built a podcast studio into my office. And so we're now in beautiful downtown McMinnville. So um, the guests, the, the, I could really go deep with this, but what I, I was not a wine drinker till about four years ago. I didn't, didn't like it. I was afraid of it. I didn't understand it. Um, but my company had um, introduced this brand new winery pr product and decided that was going to be my niche. So I specialize in wine and vineyards and um, have really become the ex expert specialist, whatever you want to say, in that field. And so, but what I fell in love with, with the wine industry was the people and the stories. So they weren't this kind of elitist, um, snooty, snobby group that I Hollywood has kind of led us to believe that the wine industry is. And so, um, I wanted to highlight and showcase to the world and really bring in um, non-wine drinkers and maybe even people that were really timid, but maybe kind of kind of poke at you know, drinking wine a little bit and really give them a good flavor of who these amazing people in the industry are. And um, currently, I mean, we are just showcasing Oregon because people have to be able to drive to the studio. We're not mobile and I don't want to do anything kind of um, via Zoom or um, online at this point. Um, so I find my guests either by word of mouth. So someone has told me, oh my God, you got to know this person. Or I've learned to find people on social media. I look for interesting feeds that are doing interesting things. They're having fun. They're enjoying life. It's not just bottle shots. You're actually seeing their candids and, and really showcasing their personalities. And then I reach out to them and if they're interested, they're interested. And if they're not, they're not. And we just kind of schedule them out from there. Well, and I started the time to cast in two. Someone quickly tell me I had already been working in Europe in the, with people in the wine industry. And I really liked them. And I had someone say, you know, these wine people, they're really snobby people and they're really unpleasant and you wouldn't like them. And I have found that I fit right in and I just yeah. love them. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, they're truly they're artistic. They're wonderful. I, yeah. I love, I, I just love it. So I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, really for the most part, at least in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, which are the three states that I work predominantly in, um, they're farmers and creatives. And so they are these wonderful, colorful people that are just, you know, and my ag background really lends to the vineyard and the farming side of it. Um, and they're just they're amazing people. They become some of my be best friends and people I enjoy having dinner with and going places with. And so, yeah, it was uh, honestly, it was shocking to me. Like I literally had to kind of eat my words and, and apologize for not bad mouthing, but just being really standoffish. And it, the tasting notes were the biggest probably problem for me, um, because it, it tells you what you're supposed to be doing and or tasting and what your palate's supposed to be saying. And I'm a do it right or don't do it at all person. And so I didn't taste tobacco and leather and whatever I was drinking. And I'm like, okay, I don't get it. I'm out. And I'd go back to beer because I, I really liked beer and do like beer. Um, but going and we'll go into the, the immersion class, but talking um, to some of the winemakers, they're like, if you like it, it's right. If you don't like it, push it aside and go to the next one because you're going to find something that fits your taste. Well, and it's so I, I have a, we set two and I actually would like to keep going with that, but it so involves chemistry and the land and the country and the food. And it's very, it is very complicated. Okay. So tell us about your new podcast studio. My new podcast studio is so beautiful. Um, I, I, um, <clears throat> So I moved into this new space about a year ago, almost a year ago. It was a blank canvas when we moved in, no walls. It was just four walls on a floor. Um, and I knew I wanted to build the podcast studio in here. So it's nothing fancy, but there's a beautiful table in there that um, my friend Steve at Oregon Winewood made me. He's made, I mean, you kind of see the desk behind me. Oops, wrong way. Um, and then oh, he's yeah. made me some really beautiful cabinetry, um, wine cabinets as well. They're just stunning. And so... 
We do have seats for four and we have professional mics and soundboards and the whole nine yards. And it's still a work in progress because I'm the one footing the bill and I can only bleed money so much before I have to put a bandaid on it. So um, it's operational and it's great. And this, and the sound sounds great. And we'll kind of just go from there. And I keep doing the same thing. I keep adding in every yeah. month. Okay. So tell us about, I know that, tell us about your wine studies and then how that went in with your insurance company naturally. You have a extensive wine studies background that we'd like to hear about. It's, I wouldn't say it's super extensive, but it was very um, intense what I did. So when I decided that I was, I got pulled into the pilot program um, for wineries um, when we were just rolling out this new product and I'd been looking for a niche and I thought, oh, I'll do dairy farms. You know, that's what I know. That's my background. I got connections, but the dairy industry is just not a, um, it's kind of a fledgling industry at this point. It's not as prolific as it was, especially in Tillamook County. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, you know, I was hoping for a beer policy, but I guess wine is what we're going to do. And so I, um, kind of jumped in head first. I uh, made some contacts at Linfield because where I went to school and my alma mater and talked to my um, former advisor, Jeff Peterson, who had, um, started putting together the Northwest wine program that they have, which is more of a business wine program, not a, how do you make wine? That's more schmeckata. Um, and he introduced me to Ellen Britton, who is just one of the most amazing women on the planet. Um, and she sat down with me and really spent a couple hours and told me what I needed to know. So I needed to know custom crush versus, you know, alternating proprietorship versus estate grapes versus blah, 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 blah. And I made pages and pages and pages of notes. And so I went back, met with my underwriting team. I wanted to know the answers to all of this because I didn't know anything. And Um, To kind of go back, my dad is a, you know, is a kind of a no nonsense, no smoke blowing kind of guy. And when people who were like in my kind of position would come on the farm, if they didn't know what and the milk came out of, he had zero time for them. So they really needed to know his business or he just didn't care to talk to him. They didn't take the time to understand him and he just whatever. So I knew that going in just because it's part of my DNA. And um, so I needed to know everything. I needed to know the operation in and out. So I did not jump in with the whole insurance sales thing because I wasn't confident in myself. Um, And so Ellen, after going back to her with all of my answers, I had answers, but I didn't really know what they all meant. Um, She um, suggested I go through the Linfield's immersion program that they had at the time, which um, was incredible. It was exactly what I needed. Um, I was... um, kind of peeved that I had to pay for it myself. I figured my company would kick in because it was helping me. But anyways, it was $2,500. That was the best money I've ever spent um, for myself, really business and personal. I mean, I just am so grateful for it. And what it was, it was, I believe it was a 12 week course. Maybe it was eight weeks. I think it was eight weeks, something like that. We started in late May and we ended at IPNC, which is the International Pinot Noir Celebration at Linfield. And so it was Tuesdays and Thursdays, eight to six. Um, we started at history and terroir and dirt, and we moved into vineyard management, winemaking, the business side of things with legal accounting, insurance, marketing, whatever. And then we ended at IPNC, which is an incredible event in the Oak Grove at Linfield. So that was instrumental in really building my confidence and really my excitement for wine. And because I was meeting all these amazing people and they were great people and they become my people. And so um, without that immersion program, I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing today. Well, and I'm very sorry they don't still have that because it sounds just wonderful. I'd love to do that too. Oh, it was brilliant. It was such a brilliant thing. And, you know, I'm hoping they'll bring it back at some point. They do have like little pockets of classes like that. I mean, Jeff Peterson has a, a, like a vineyard boot camp or something like that, that he does that is kind of an intense deep dive into vineyard management and things like that. That sounds wonderful. Mm-hmm. Now, did you want to talk a little bit more about your insurance company or do you think I that you love to. Yeah, talk a little bit more about your insurance company? Tell yeah, little I little. love what I do and I don't that's usually that's tell great. people what I, huh? That's that. great. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I don't usually tell people right off the bat what my day job is because insurance has such a, um, negative connotation with, um, you know, being sharks and just nothing but sales and 
just blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, and I totally get it because I don't like people like that. You know, the whole used car, car salesman, you know, old time, whatever. And so um, my approach to my job and I have a team of three. So um, I did not intend to have a team of all girls, but I have three. There's four of us. Plus my marketing gal is a is a girl, too. So I guess there's a team of five. Um, of us, but it's really relationship based. Um, insurance is very intimate. It's very, it's not a sexy industry by any means, um, but we really try to make it fun. And it is an intimate thing because you are really truly protecting what you love. So whether it's your home, your car, your vineyard, your family, yourself, you know, whatever it is that your, your employees, whatever you're doing, I mean, we really take a relationship type approach and a hands on approach to everybody we work with. We want them to be friends. We want them to be, you know, confident that they can call us. We are not an eight to five office. We are a 24 seven office. Um, both myself and my um, production manager usually give our cell phone numbers um, to clients and they can reach us through social media too. And we're always on, um, you know, when something bad happens, I want people to reach me and not the 1-800 number. Um, so in the last four years, we, I have switched um, I still do a lot of home and auto and um, whatever, but I I specialize in my niche is truly in wine and vineyard and farms and small business. So those and breweries and cideries, I can do all that stuff, um, but really have, have dove head first into that and um, love it. And really, I think of making an impact in the industry and changing the, the narrative. Um, I think a lot of insurance has been very hands off. It hasn't always been um, done in a way that's beneficial to the client. It's more beneficial to the insurance company. And I find a lot of large gaps and holes in policies every time I look at one. So um, we want people to sleep well at night and know that if something bad happens, that they're protected and, and they are going to be made whole again as much as we can. And how did you figure out how to how to incorporate the the wineries into your insurance? I know you said you contacted the underwriter and you studied and then you needed to really know mm -hmm. the wine industry really well so that you could communicate. Do you how did you do that exactly? Are you able to communicate that? Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, with my my just my personality and then just kind of my strategy all along with business has, I hate being on the phone, um, which is, you know, you're supposed to be making calls and you're supposed to be calling people. And I just, I hate it. And so I've always created events that were super fun and usually directed to whatever market I was wanting to work with at the time. And so I, had cre and, you know, with creating those events, you then have people that are there and then they meet you and they're like, Oh, you're great. You're fun. You know, whatever. And then they, they call you and that's, um, kind of has been my strategy all along and it's worked out really well. And so I started that with the wine industry right up front because I, w I just needed to make um, connections and meet people. Um, the wine industry, at least in Oregon, is very tight knit. Um, they, they don't allow a lot of outsiders in um, just because I think they've all been, they've been burned in the past. Um, and um, so they're pretty protective of themselves, which I don't blame them at all. Um, and so I knew I needed to be in the circle somehow and whether that was um, doing an event and bringing people in or um, and being, you know, an insurance professional, whatever it is, I, I know I needed to be on the inside. So I started with an event I created called Vinayami, Me, which is Wine and Friends in French. I hope that's the translation. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> For five years. Um, but it was a way... And I, and I'm horrible. Like if you invite me to an event, if I've already gone home, odds of me not, of not going are pretty good. Um, I'm a homebody and I love to be home. We have eight acres up on Eola Hills and I just love being there. Um, but if I create an event, I have to leave my house because I'm in charge. And so it was a way for me to create an experience and a wine tasting for um, whatever winery in the area I chose. And I'd invite my girlfriends who also had teenagers that needed to get away from them um, <laughs> out for a night. And it was, it worked, it was amazing. It was so much fun. And um, we painted some nights, we did barrel tasting some nights, we did library tasting some nights. And so we did a little bit of everything. Oh, that sounds wonderful. So you just, so it was kind of, was it like a book club kind of thing or just a wine tasting that happened? Once a month? 
It was, um, yeah, it was more of a wine tasting that happened. Wine once tasting. I usually would, you know, choose the winery and we, you know, discuss what we were going to do with, you know, the wine owner or whoever it was. And then my girlfriends would all pay whatever it was that needed to be paid that would cover the, um, the tasting fees and then whatever activity we were doing. So sometimes it was 20 bucks, sometimes it was 50 bucks. Um, and they pay in advance and come to the thing and they'd always leave with wine. And it was just, it was just a great event. I think I blew a few people away. A couple of wine was like, this isn't going to work. Nobody ever buys wine at these things. And that person in particular, I think probably sold almost two grand worth of wine that night. Oh, wow. Um, and you know, every time someone tells me that, that's, that's a big mistake. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it is. There through. are those that come in and they do their little paint night and that, or whatever it is that they're doing, and then they leave and they don't buy any wine. But the expectation I set with everybody is that you need to go home with at least a bottle. So, okay, great. And then yeah. you help the winery too. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about your social media usage. Oh. You're, you do a great job on social media. I know okay. that, and I want to ask you about your videos. You do videos, it seems like on a daily basis, but how do you use your social media to market your business and what works and what doesn't? And let's talk a little bit. Let's start with your video usage. You're, do you use video on a daily basis? And how no. do you know <laughs> how, how often do you record video? No, um, my video usage has grown like, exponentially because when we first started the podcast, um, Shay is my assistant and um, she is my right hand man. I cannot live life without her. Um, she, and she was kind of the one that was there for the podcast. I, I didn't know Sammy at the time who's my marketing um, coordinator. Um, so, and I would tell her, I'm like, you know, don't take videos, no boomerangs, no pictures, no, nothing. I just wasn't very, I wasn't comfortable at all in front of the camera. Still photos were okay here and there. Um, but I hated video. Like I'm like, it puts 10 pounds on you and I don't look good <laughs> and I talk weird and you know, whatever. And so, um, through encouragement from both Sammy and Shay, um, I have gotten very comfortable with video. And so we have started using it a lot more, um, we've shot two different branding videos, um, one um, that I use for work mostly. Um, the first one um, is all about my story and who I am and where I came from and why it's a connection to the, the wine industry and the vineyards and whatever. Um, the second one is all about the wine industry. It's more of a testimonial documentary style video that hasn't um, been finished yet. So that's coming hopefully in the next week or two. Um, but video has become... Um, people respond to it. They, they love it. It's more, um, entertaining. It's more, you know, it really can showcase who you are. So we do, um, insure what you love Thursdays, um, which is Shay and I, um, we break down a topic of insurance because insurance is a foreign language to virtually everybody on the planet. It reads very Latin. If you look through it, I mean, people have no idea what their declaration pages say. So we are trying to break down some of these, myths, some of these um, different products, some of these different endorsements, things like that, that mean things to people. So it could be a small business week. It could be a vineyard and vin wine week. It could be auto insurance. I mean, we do a little bit of everything. So every Thursday ish, <laughs> it, sometimes we miss a Thursday. Um, we do a video of some sort and I usually have it on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. So I think you do a great job with your videos. Do you shoot yeah. it from your phone or do you have them shoot it from a camera? Oh no, it, it's phone. I am I am not techie, so the phone does a great job. So you just do. So you do it yourself. So you okay? Yeah. Well, then I need I need to do that also. I'm doing yeah. this, which is very time consuming, but I also need to. I, I had the same fear of video, and now I'm used yeah. to it. But just, just uh, you know. Yeah who's going to see this? What do I look like? You know, yep. And then I think it was in the middle of COVID when none of our hair looked good. <laughs> I haven't had yeah. my hair cut in a year and are <laughs> colored. So anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. So I was having the same kind of problem with, and then I just got started and it's just kind of normal. So it's easy. I mean, Sammy has really pushed me um, to really expand. And so we do wine Wednesdays, um, which is um, more podcast related. So it'll be the Wednesday usually unless I mean her and I are extremely busy with work and so sometimes it pushes to Thursday but it's really it's really a teaser to who we have coming up um on the show on Friday and so um it's goofy it's silly it's we're just being ourselves and having a great time we open a bottle of wine and we've started um partnering with a local um boutique um to 
wear their clothes and jewelry. <laughs> so I, it, I mean, which is fun. I get to go play dress up down the street and it's great. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, and then um, I do just random videos if something kind of catches my attention, but I don't do it every day. Okay. Yeah. It looks like you do it every day when I look at your social yeah. media. Like, how does she do that every day? Yeah. Okay. So this is a common question right now, but what do you think you've done to pivot your business during this unprecedented pandemic? Um, I, you know, the biggest thing with us is um, we really wanted to just focus on the relationships with our clients and really reaching out to them and telling them, you know, that we're there, it's going to be okay. You know, what do they need? I mean, we really didn't pivot a whole lot other than we, Shay specifically, um, learned how to work remotely um, a lot better than I did. I don't work remotely. I'm horrible. You put me at home with my computer and I will find anything and everything else to do. My laundry was always caught up. I landscaped my yard. I mean, I just, <laughs> I don't work remotely well. And so I'm very much a people person. And so I struggled with that probably more than she did um, specifically. Um but other than that, I mean, it just was messaging and and really kind of deepening those relationships and really trying to just be there for clients. And honestly, we had our best year ever. I mean, I've been with country for 14 years and on a production level, we just I don't know what happened, but we had an amazing year. Oh, that's so wonderful. Well, there were I guess there were a lot of maybe there was a lot of fear and people really needed to have you involved. I, maybe, but it wasn't like everybody rushed to do life insurance, you know, and I kind of expected more life insurance kind of with COVID because everybody was so afraid of, you know, the, the you know, the dead, deadliness of it. And that really wasn't what it was. I, I really can't explain it. I guess the big thing that we, I did do was I finally found an office. I've been looking for seven years for the right space. And because of COVID and McMinnville, and every the rest of the world being shut down, this office became vacant and nobody wanted to take it because the unknown was so great. And I walked right in and signed the lease and pissed my husband off because I didn't really talk to him about it first. And <laughs> we went to work. So and uh, it took and it's us a wonderful three, office too. Yeah, three or four months to create and and we moved in in September. Okay, great. And so what would you say? What are your tips for increasing followers on your social media platforms? Um, just be yourself. Um, I mean, for me specifically, what I'm attracted to is people being themselves. Um, not a lot of staged pictures, uh, you know, just really kind of snapshots and candidates of your life. Um, I think you, you know, you really grow your following that way and you kind of deepen the following that you do have that are so you don't get these in and out people constantly. Um, we really started partner partnering with, you know, what we call strategic partners. So partners, people in the industry that have great followings already and kind of just going partnering and doing things with them, whether it's a giveaway or a promo or an event or something. So um, I'd say those strategic partners are great because, you know, they've, they've already kind of done the hard work and it sounds terrible, but they've already done the hard work and they've grown this huge platform, some of them, and you're kind of piggybacking on what they've done by kind of coming in and, and um, hanging out with them. So ha sort of having an influencer involved as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yep. So what are some of your uh, tips for moving forward successfully or tips for women, whatever you'd like to share some of your, um, your favorite tips? <clears throat> I, I would say be bold, um, be bold and, and, and be, be fearless. Um, I, you know, I have a really bad past with my first marriage and um, was really kind of a squashed soul and um, really no confidence or self-esteem at all. And so what I've built my business to be was a huge step. I've had to go out on a limb and, and go outside of my comfort zone a lot, but I really um, encourage people to step outside that that bubble, you know, step outside that box and do something maybe you've been wanting to, but you are just afraid to. And um, the day that I put a billboard up was probably the most sick I've ever felt and nervous because here I am on a 20 by 40 billboard on the highway and um, with my face on it. And it was terrifying. Um, I just didn't have any confidence at all. And if you meet me now, you'll be, oh, you, I'm sure you've been like this all the time, you know, your whole life. And it, that's not the case at all. And I was a very broken person for a long time. Um, so, you know, persevering. And um, I guess the biggest thing with me is being positive. There's some 
crappy situations out there that just look bleak and negative, but you can always take something positive away from it. You know, as terrible as my marriage was, I take positive things away from it. I'm like, I learned lessons. I, um, you know, I believe in karma and doing good and being grateful and gracious and kind and, it all comes back around, but you also have to have that little bit of audacity to succeed and move forward as well. And, you know, and a lot of times we, we have to spiritually grow. Sometimes these people that come into our life are teachers that teach us. And sometimes it teaches us what we don't want. And then we move forward to what we yeah. do want. So yep. quite often these growing experiences that are unpleasant <laughs> lead us to yep. brighter futures and happy things. So I, I love, totally agree. I, yep. I agree too. Been there, done yep. that in different, yep. in different situations. <laughs> so and then I would say one of the things that you're doing and that I have done is persevere and move forward with just move, move forward boldly and go for it. And I would say doing video, et cetera, is a fearful thing to do. And you just start, start moving forward and go. Yep. So, okay. So in closing here, the time to win broadcast is this video will be featured on a Friday at 11 a.m. I'm switching over most likely to once a week for live streaming, but the Time to Wine broadcast is fe featuring experts in wine, social media, leadership, and marketing, and the broadcast is on the second and fourth Monday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. The live stream broadcast interview is the first and third Friday of the month. So I want to give a special thank you to Heidi, who's two hours away from me. We're in the same time zone. Generally, I'm, I'm talking to someone in Italy or South Africa. So this is kind of fun. I can That's actually awesome. I can actually visit her and give her a big hug virtually from mm -hmm. Eugene, Oregon. And thank you so much. And we really enjoyed talking to you and enjoyed your first little broadcast. And she's going to be answering questions on LinkedIn today that I'm going to post about podcasting and on Facebook. So thank you so much, Heidi. Anything else you want to add? I don't know. I think I probably said too much. So okay. But okay, I'm good. so if you have questions, I'm usually Oh, how do people uh, reach you? I've got you um here on social media. So here are your this is your platforms. So talk a little bit about how people reach you. Um, there's a couple of different ways. Um, the easiest is through our, our um, podcast um, website um, that is beautiful. Um, Sammy created it for us. Um, and it's winecrushpodcast.com. So that's easy. But you can find me on um, Instagram at winecrushpodcast. Um, on Facebook, it's probably easier to find me personally. But it's going to be Heidi Harris Moore. Um, and, um, or you can just email me, um, and work is the best email. So it's Heidi Perry more country com. but, um, find me on social media and just message me. Um, my cell phone is on there too. And you can text me there too, if you really want to. Okay. Thank you so much, Heidi. Bye. Bye. See you. Thanks. <laughs>